Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. We'll continue this morning where we left off yesterday in our reading and discussion of this most wonderful Protestant work entitled The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy by Michael Dissemlian. This morning we're going to begin Chapter 4. We just got started on it yesterday at the conclusion of the broadcast, so we'll retreat to the beginning. This is on page 23, if you're following along in the online copy of this book. And by the way, you can find a link uh, to this uh, online version on my website, inquisitionupdate.org. And uh, below the video screen there, you'll find a link to the book. Just click on it there and you can follow along. Again, we're on page 23, chapter 4. The title is Futurism devised across the centuries by the Jesuit. Now, let me make an adjustment here. A little bit too much. Oh, my mic got too hot or what? Anyway, uh, the discussion this morning is going to center on futurism, which I call the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. We're going to talk about other papal pretensions and lies and deceptions, but this one tops them all. Futurism. Futurism is that great deception called in the Bible the grand delusion, the strong delusion. And if it were possible, it would deceive even the very elect. Now, if I consider myself one of the very elect, then I have to be on my knees this morning and confess that for 50 years of my life I believed this. It's all I was ever taught. But thank God to true Bible-believing Protestants and uh, some valuable Protestant works, God found a way to put in my hands. I've repented of this futurism. And I now hold the same interpretation of Bible prophecy that Christians for centuries had held prior to this, the rise of this grand delusion called futurism. The author begins by saying the futurist interpretation of prophecy, and by the way, this is the counterfeit interpretation of prophecy, the system of uh, interpretation held by Christians prior to the rise of futurism was historicism. That the account uh, of the the the, uh, the uh, prophecies uh, in the book, particularly the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation and others, outlines the entire history of the Christian kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, and. Uh, Paul warned about a, a falling away that would take place not long after his decease. And that falling away did occur. And after that fall, the, the Caesars of Rome, the, those who, that, that which was restraining the rise of the papacy, uh, ended with the fall of the pagan Roman Empire and which was succeeded by the man of sin, just like Daniel prophesied, the papacy. And it's been known among God's people, without question, known with assurity, who the Antichrist is, who the man of sin is, who the little horn of Daniel is. It's the papacy, and there's no other candidate for the role. So, the papacy had to come up with an alternative way of interpreting the prophecies. It had to come up with counterfeit Bibles that would support the notion that the Antichrist, the man of sin, the little horn, cannot be the papacy. All right, so futurism is that masterfully conceived deception that is universally believed in the Christian churches today. And it exonerates the papacy. 
of the role of Antichrist in the world and places the onus of Antichrist on a single individual that comes just before Christ's return. Now, this is repetition for my regular listeners. I apologize. I always have to take care of the new ones coming in. So, All right. The author says the futurist interpretation of prophecy was originally propounded by the Spanish Jesuit scholar Francisco Ribera and was developed by the eminent Jesuit saint, quote-unquote saint, that is a Roman Catholic saint, and apologist, Roman Catholic apologist, Cardinal Bellarmine, at the end of the 16th century. Ribera's ingenious scheme was part of the spiritual counterattack known as the Counter-Reformation, the spearhead of Rome's fight back against the growing threat posed by the Protestant Reformation. That's right. The Protestant Reformation was seen as by the was seen by the Vatican as a lethal threat. And for good reason. Because the Protestant Reformation made it widely known all over Europe, that it was the papacy and the papacy alone that could fill the role of Antichrist in the world. And Europe was convinced. The largest share of Europe was convinced. Even the kings of the nations of Europe were convinced. The kings of the nations who had previously served the papacy and uh, ruled the people on the papacy's behalf and passed laws consistent with Roman Catholic canon law to make everyone Catholic, whether they were Catholic or not. Okay, the civil laws were simply a way that the papacy could impose Roman Catholic canon law on every man, woman, and child, whether they professed Roman Catholicism or not. If they were not Catholic at heart, they were certainly bound to Roman Catholic canon law. That was the law of the land. When the Protestant Reformation came, the people demanded that their kings and their queens and their potentates no longer serve the papacy because he was the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. And that the kings and queens of the earth had no right to impose Roman Catholic canon law on the people. <clears throat> now, if those governments wouldn't cooperate with the new belief that the papacy is the Antichrist and throw off those Roman Catholic canon laws and then pass laws to preserve the people's liberties instead of keeping them bound to papal subservience, then they overthrew their governments. Or their governments simply had to retire to be replaced by those who were friends of the Bible. So, the Vatican was losing ground. Vast regions of Europe were departing from the Roman Catholic Church. The governments of those countries now serve the people and not the Pope. People began to enjoy rights, and other nations, even Roman Catholic nations, began to be jealous or envious or covetousness of those new human rights. And uh, so they were even contemplating a shift toward Protestantism. And the papacy could rightly see it losing complete and total control and literally being reduced to nothing. And so, and all the, uh, all the taxes that were collected for the papacy, all the money that was coming into Rome was going to dry up. And without the money, honey, you don't have any power. You can claim to be the vicar of Christ, the, 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 the successor of Peter. You can cry till the cows come home. And if you don't have the power to wield your authority and influence around the world, you lose that influence. And that's what the Protestant Reformation was doing, reducing the papacy to what it was, 
the Antichrist of the Bible. So the Protestant Reformation posed the most lethal threat that ever existed against the papacy. The Protestant Reformation was the most lethal threat ever to threaten the papacy from its inception. The Protestant Reformation remains today the greatest potential lethal threat that the papacy has ever faced. So the Jesuits have to annihilate Protestantism. They have to come up with a way to exonerate the papacy of the widely held claim that the papacy is the Antichrist. That's what futurism does. Now it says the 16th century futurist theories of Ribera, this Jesuit priest by the name of Ribera, which projected forward all but the first five books of the book of Revelation into the future, and pointed forward to an individual and political antichrist. No, the antichrist is not the papacy. It's not the whole history of the Roman Catholic Church as is widely believed by the Protestant reformers. No, it's just one single individual, and he won't arise and no way off in the distant future, so we don't have to worry about Antichrist anymore. And oh, by the way, if you believe in this future Antichrist, then you have exonerated the papacy, and you have literally repudiated the Protestant Reformation. You have committed Protestant suicide, because Protestantism is based on the belief the historical, prophetic, and scriptural belief that the papacy and the papacy alone is the Antichrist of the Bible. So if you believe in a future Antichrist, then you just need to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. You've just, you've just buried yourself in, in, in humiliation. So, see how it works? That's how it works. So futurism exonerates the papacy and damns the Protestant Reformation as a war against the authentic and literal throne of God on the earth, the papacy. All right. And the 16th century future theories of Ribera, which project forward all but the first five chapters of the book of Revelation into the future, and pointed forward to an individual and political Antichrist, found little favor with Protestants for approaching two and a half centuries. Why did futurism fall on deaf ears in the Protestant world? Because they believed the papacy was the Antichrist. They saw through the scheme that it was an attempt to exonerate the papacy, and they would not believe it. Okay? There was too much history, a thousand years, fifteen hundred years of history that proved that the papacy was the Antichrist. The history of the popes, we've read them right here on Inquisition Update. The Vic Vicars of Christ, the dark side of the papacy, is only one of the many books that we've read here enumerating the, the diabolical nature of the popes throughout history. And the Protestants were, were, were well aware of that diabolical history of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. And nobody was going to exonerate the papacy. Okay? So they didn't believe in a future Antichrist when they knew that the Antichrist had been perse persecuting the saints of Almighty God since its very first inception. All right? It says... The, 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 uh, the belief in a future and individual and political Antichrist found little favor with Protestants for approaching two and a half centuries. However, the Jesuit theories had laid the groundwork for the radical departure from the widely accepted historicist view. Okay? So, 
it laid the groundwork for the overthrow of historicism, which is just another way of saying we believe the Antichrist is the, is the, uh, the papacy. Okay? All right. Ribera's ideas were further developed in a book first published at the beginning of the 19th century, which has ex exercised inestimable influence on the church right up to the present day. Now, my listeners are going to recognize much of what we'll read here today and probably the next couple of days as a virtual repeat of a little booklet that I read some years ago here on First Amendment Radio called Dispensational Futurism and its Entry into Protestant Christianity. The author obviously gets his information from, this, from that very same source. He says the book, <clears throat> the book which was written in Spanish, was called The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty. Already he recognized that this is where, what we learned about in that little pamphlet. It says it laid the basis for dispensational futurism and originated the theory of the two-stage second coming of Christ. Okay? The Bible talks about the Lord's glorious appearing, right? But it's singular, isn't it? The Lord's glorious appearings? No. The Lord's glorious appearing. Okay? But this book, this Jesuit-inspired lie called The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty, laid the basis and the groundwork for dispensational futurism and the two-stage second coming of Christ, once secretly and then once visibly. All right, it was written under the name Ben Ezra, who represented himself as a scholarly Jewish convert to Christ, seeking enlightenment for his Jewish brethren. Okay, here we have a Jesuit posing as a Messianic Jew. Now, who do you think this Jesuit is going to draw sympathy and attention from? Obviously, Protestants. Because Protestants who read their Bibles, which is requisite for being a Protestant, understand from Paul that we're not to persecute the Jews. That Paul even said that he would give up his own salvation for the salvation of his brethren, the Jews. And that we were not supposed to boast against the Jews, but our role as Gentile Christians was to provoke the Jews to jealousy for our Savior. Okay? Any true Bible-believing Protestant who reads his Bible and understands what Paul was saying has nothing but sympathy for the Jew, love for the Jew. We want the Jews to come to the Christ that they rejected 2,000 years ago. We understand that salvation came to the Gentile world because of their rejection of Jesus. We're beneficiaries of their ignorance and blindness. And so the right thing for us to do is to try to hold them up, to bring them to Christ. That's the mission of the Gentile church. Because we could be one spiritually, one flesh. No Jew, no Gentile, but believers together in Christ. Let me pose this to you. If the Protestants had not repudiated their Protestantism, that is their claim that the papacy is the Antichrist, <coughs> And if we would, been, we would have been faithful to our God-given mission, according to Paul, to uphold the Jewish people and bring them to Christ, that together we could serve Christ as brethren, spiritual brethren, that God's house would no longer be uh, uh, divided but united, where would that leave Rome and the papacy? 
If Jew and Gentile understood their common faith in Christ, what would be left of the papacy? It is absolutely essential that they never develop a common belief in Christ between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. Because together they would become Protestant, wouldn't they? They would become historicist, wouldn't they? So not only does Rome fear most of all the Protestant Reformation, but it fears a spiritual homecoming between Jew and Gentile Christians. All right, so that the papacy can ne ne allow neither thing to exist together. Per first of all, you've got to destroy Protestantism because it's the Protestants who can proselyze the Jews. If you can get the Protestants to repudiate their Protestantism, then they've got no power. That's what Rome wants, a disarmed enemy. Okay, And then that leaves the Jews in disbelief, which is right up Rome's alley. Rome can then become the Jewish Messiah. The Vatican, the papacy, can become the Jewish Messiah. That's what they want. And if the Jews don't come to the Pope, then just like throughout all history, history which has been lost to us, the Roman Catholic Church regards them as heretics and kills them. So that's the history. That's why Jews, whenever they see a Christian cross, they recoil. They're repulsed by the Christian cross because of the historic persecution of the Jews by the Roman Catholic Church. Anti-Semitism, if you'll call it that, it's anti-Jew hatred. If, if it ever raised, where it raised its head in the world first was Rome. And Rome has always hated the Jewish people. Rome, the Vatican, <clears throat> the papacy has always coveted the throne upon which Christ sits. The papacy wishes to be God on earth. The vicar of God. Christ in the flesh. That's what the papacy has always taught of itself. All right, so here's a Jesuit pretending to be a Messianic Jew which Protestants would naturally have a sympathy for, and interested in reading his book, this supposed Jewish Messianic Jew is talking about a two-stage second coming of Christ. He's laying the groundwork for dispensational futurism, which we know is a Jesuit creation. And uh, later on, his identity was discovered, the Jesuit Ribera. But he posed himself as a Jewish rabbi by the name of Ben Ezra, it, who represented himself as a Jewish scholar, and he was seeking Christ in order to enlighten his Jewish brethren. So that's how the Jesuits got the ear of Protestants. This is how the grand delusion, the strong delusion that has the capability of deceiving even the very elect, got its start. And we'll continue to examine this when we get back from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. We'll be right back after this.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening since the beginning of time kings have sought it nations have fought for it It has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this broadcast, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. Now we'll continue at the bottom of page 23 on the book. By the way, the title is The Foundations Under Attack, The Roots of Apostasy by Michael DeSemley. And we're talking about the great apostasy that we see in the churches today. This ecumenical movement back to Rome. I call it the ecumenical movement. A bunch of maniacs. I'm, I'm sorry to be so frank. It's it's like something dreadful has come over their minds. Maniacal. But they've been lied to, just as I was. And so maybe I should have more sympathy. But I don't give myself much slack either. I'll be the rest of my life repenting of futurism. It's enough to make me repent in sackcloth and ashes. And the more I learn about futurism, and the more I learn about what God's people have believed for centuries and centuries and centuries, and how diabolical futurism was, and how it so deceived me. I find it difficult to forgive myself. And maybe that's why I'm so passionate about futurism. Maybe God should temper me a bit. But how can one be tempered after learning the roots of futurism and what its purpose was originally and what it has accomplished 
in the house of God. I don't see how one can speak dispassionately about the damage that futurism has done to the saints of Almighty God. Now the author continues, he says, Although the Church of Rome distanced itself from Ben Ezra, this Jesuit posing as a Messianic Jew who wrote the book, The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty, look, Rome, Rome had to distance itself from Ben Ezra, this Jewish priest. This Jewish priest was accomplishing the destruction of Protestantism. Rome could not make herself, allow herself to be associated with that. Or the Protestants would have been awakened. The Protestants would have been awakened to it. So the Vatican denounced this Ben Ezra. Okay? And they put his book on the list of forbidden books. And that in itself was strategic because Protestants generally filled their libraries with books that were banned by the papacy. Why did the papacy ban books? The papacy banned books that were Protestant in their belief, that were Protestant in their writings. Protestant books were forbidden for Roman Catholics to read. So Protestants thought the list of banned books to select their reading material. So the Vatican strategically banned Ben Ezra's book, Ben Ezra's futurist book. This Jesuit posing as a Jew to whom Protestants would have sympathy. So the Vatican just lured the entire Protestant world to read Ben Ezra's book. It says, although the Church of Rome distanced itself from Ben Ezra and even banned his book in some countries, it seems highly probable that this was a deception perpetrated by the Jesuits, comparable in ingenuity and scope with any of the many elaborate wiles and schemes that have been devised in the long history of, pap of the papal institution. Now, we're going to talk about some of those other grave deceptions and schemes and wiles that the papacy has conducted. And this is going to be a repetition for my regular listeners, but it's important for us to understand that the papacy has always deceived the world. It must, because if the truth is ever known, you get a Protestant Reformation. All right? It says it may be helpful and instructive to give but one other important example in history of this kind of deception from the Roman Catholic Church. For four centuries before the Protestant Reformation, the Church of Rome built up her pretensions on what are known as the Decretals of Isidore. Okay? You've heard me mention them many, many times here on Inquisition Update before. I've called them the Isidorian Decretals. Okay? Let me tell you, in brief, what the Isidorian Decretals were and what they accomplished. First of all, the papacy stakes its claim to the throne of God on the earth on what is known as the, the, the patrimony of Peter or the succession of Peter, every pope. Is, is believed by the Roman Catholic world to be a successor of Peter. And this is based on another lie that what Rome teaches, that Peter was the, became the rock and foundation of the church, that Jesus made Peter, the apostle, the rock and the foundation of the Christian church. Now, we know differently, those of us who read the Bible, the Bible clearly says, And whom say ye that I am? And Peter said, Thou art the rock, the son of the living God. And then Jesus answered him and said, On this rock will I establish my church. What is that rock? What is that foundation? That Jesus is the son of the living God. 
But Rome says no, Jesus meant to make Peter the rock and the foundation of the church. Peter, who denied Christ three times. Nonetheless, the meaning of the scripture is clear, but Rome has twisted it for her advantage and, 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 and has always claimed that the papacy, the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, the chief bishop, the bishop of bishop, the papacy, is a successor of Peter, that, that Peter's office as the rock and foundation of the church has been passed down throughout the centuries through all the popes. And the first pope was ordained by Peter. Trouble with that is, Rome could never prove it. It was just a claim. So Rome continually had to live with this embarrassment, this embarrassment never ceasing to claim that it, it, the popes are the successors of Peter, but always having to hide from the question, well, how do you prove this, Mr. Pope? How do you prove that you're a successor of Peter? So this became a grievous hindrance to the papacy, an embarrassment, and so this Roman Catholic historian and, well, fiction writer, <laughs> to put it frankly, just dreamt up all the history of popes all the way back to Peter, for which previously there was no record. And uh, he, he simply drew from thin air the names of all the previous popes and their successors all the way back to Peter to prove, to provide the papacy with the proof that it never had before. Well, anyhow, these decretals of St. Isidore are fictitious. And what they are is a collection of papal bulls and papal rescripts supposedly issued by the bishops of Rome during the first three centuries of the Christian era. Right, now, when did the Christian era begin? Well, it began, we could just formally say, at the day of Pentecost, but certainly during the day of Peter. Okay, That's what's important to Rome. And so here we have now for the first time, being previously absent for centuries, any record of this changing of the guard from Peter to the first pope. Well, they say Peter was the first pope, but the second, third, fourth, all the way to three or four centuries worth of popes that they couldn't account for, all of a sudden, not only did Isidore come up with their names, but a bunch of papal bulls and rescripts that they had written, showing their authority. And my, 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 what authority they exercised. You can just about imagine. We've talked about it plainly here on Inquisition Update over the years. The, the miracles that these previous popes had had done and their direct communication with heaven and heaven dropping uh, uh, commands upon the popes written in pure gold okay all kinds of stuff that wowed the fools of that age all right these all come from a man by the name of Isidore and he was from Seville and he produced all this false history and then it was hidden for a number of centuries until it finally surfaced. Of course, the papacy made bait, great fanfare. Now it had in its hands this uh, divinely inspired proof of its authority over the Christian world. Okay, It says, for four centuries before the Protestant Reformation, the Church of Rome built up her pretensions on what are known as the Decretals of Isidore, a fictitious collection of bulls and rescripts supposedly issued by the bishops of Rome of the first three centuries of the Christian era. The Decretals were said to evidence the authority of the popes in that early age. They were supposed to represent the fruit of the researches of Isidore of Seville, one of the most learned bishops of the ninth century. Okay? The ninth century, almost a thousand years after Christ, 
They waited for nine centuries to come up with all these lying wonders. All right? It says, in the general ignorance that characterized that quote-unquote golden age of the Roman Catholic Church, the decretals of Isidore were everywhere accepted as authentic, and men beheld with awe the power wielded by Peter and his immediate quote-unquote successors. So, now the gap has been filled. 900 years of, it, of ignorance, the popes could count themselves, the bishops of Rome, back to about the 3rd or 4th century, but before that they had no record. All of a sudden, now they have the record, not only of the, the names of these popes, but all their acts, all of their wondrous acts. Okay, and it says, during the Reformation, the genuine history of these centuries was examined, the forgery was discovered, and the decretals of Isidore exposed, vying with the donation of Constantine as the most audacious imposture ever palmed off on an unsuspecting world. Yet for four centuries they did their work, and Rome reaped the benefit. So for four centuries... These false decretals, these fabrications, and that's the best word you can give them, were treated as authentic. They were believed, and they arrogated to the Pope the throne of the Almighty God on the earth. Now, they were later proven to be forgeries. Rome, when the subject comes up, Rome just exits the room. But it's universally held that these are false decretals, that they are fabrications, and they're positively debunked. And Rome even ceases to be embarrassed by that, just as she ceases to be embarrassed by the so-called donation of Constantine. This was another forgery that preceded the, the, uh, the uh, decretals of Isidore, which said that the emperor Constantine literally gave right to the Bishop of Rome to rule the world in his absence. And that the, the papacy had the right to his throne and his vestments and the cardinal of the, what is known now as the Cardinal of Colleges, uh, the, cardinal, uh, the, the College of Cardinals, was the Roman Senate before. And so Rome palmed off that deception long before the decretals of Isidore. Both are widely known and understood, and nobody even argues the fact anymore. They're falsehoods, fabrications. So every pretension of the papacy, every right to rule, every divine right, to rule over spiritual things, every divine right to rule over temporal things are based on these falsehoods. And yet the world still bends the knee to the Pope. Okay? Rome's not even embarrassed by these revelations. Rome insists that they are genuine and that the papacy is the legitimate throne of God on the earth, and that all the kings of the earth, as they did before the Protestant Reformation, should answer to the papacy alone. Okay, The Pope is, is, is Lord of Lords over spiritual things, but he's also King of Kings. And so all of these pretensions are based on the donation of Constantine, and its successor in the nineteenth in the ninth century called the Decretals of Isidore. Okay? Now the author calls these two fabrications the most audacious impostures ever palmed off on an unsuspecting world. But when you begin to comprehend what futurism has done. you begin to understand that they so that futurism so outstrips the donation of Constantine and the decretals of Isidore as to be laughable. 
And this is why I call futurism the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. I might just as well have said the decretals of Isidore and the donation of Constantine were the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. But they pale in comparison to what futurism does to God's people. Okay? The donation of Constantine and the Isidore's, Isidorean decretals deceived the world for a time. Futurism appears to be deceiving God's people until Christ's return. And it has greater consequences to the world than the donation of Constantine and the Isidorean decretals to put together. All right. Now, Rabbi Juan Jehoshaphat Ben Ezra, now you know his full name, his full pretended name. This is a Jesuit priest posing as a rabbi, a, a Jewish rabbi, Messianic Jewish rabbi, was in fact the assumed name of Emmanuel Lacunta, a Chilean of Spanish descent. Okay? Chile has always been Roman Catholic. Jesuits run the place. Emmanuel Lacunta was just one of the Jesuits, and he took it upon himself to write this book, and under the under the pseudonym Juan Jehoshaphat Ben Ezra. All right, he was a Jesuit who joined the order at the age of 16 and had raised within it to be a zealous superintendent of the novitiates. Okay, the novitiates is where the entry level for the Jesuits. He ran schools and how boarding houses for upcoming Jesuits, and he did this before embarking on the task of writing the four volumes of the coming of the Messiah in glory and majesty. So he was a well-accomplished Je uh, Jesuit, and uh, his masterwork was this book. And it said, had not his true identity been discovered and much later been made known uh, through his untimely and mysterious death, the Christian world would have continued to believe, as many still do today, that he was a Messianic Jew. But by the providence of God, his true Jesuit identity was known. Now, I wish the rest of the world knew how phony his futurist deceptions are. Okay. With the Jews of his day marginalized by the Roman Catholic Church, this identity was ideal for gaining acceptance from Protestants. We've already discussed that. There can be little doubt that it was for the consumption of Protestants that this elaborate Jesuitical deception was prepared to get them to begin to dab in the theory of a future Antichrist who's worth a was worth a vast amount of time and labor to the Roman Catholic Church. Why was it worth so much? Again, I'm repeating myself. If you can just get the Protestants to believe in a future Antichrist, then you've gotten them to admit that the papacy is not the Antichrist and that the Protestant Reformation was an assault against the throne of Almighty God, the papacy. Okay? You can... If you can get the Protestants to believe in a future Antichrist, then they have, by default, exonerated the papacy. And they themselves, with their own mouth and with their own actions, have admitted that the Protestant Reformation was not a move of God, was not the result of reading Scripture and history, and was an assault against the throne of Almighty God, the papacy. You see how masterfully they have made Catholics of us all? Now you know why everybody's running headlong back to the Roman Catholic Church in this, this ecumenical evangelical belly movement, thanks to a Jesuit priest who wouldn't be a Jesuit unless he had sworn an oath to destroy Protestantism. That's the only purpose for their existence. And this Juan Jehoshaphat Ben Ezra was only one of a multitude of Jesuits who have sworn a bloody oath to destroy Protestantism. Now, without annihilating every, Pro every Protestant in the world, which would have been nearly impossible to do, even with nuclear weapons back then, how can you destroy Protestantism without drawing any blood? Just get them to believe a lie. Just get them to believe a lie. And that's what they did. The Jesuits don't 
take on their enemies one-on-one -on -one in armed combat. They're too smart for that. They know that we come to the truth through the power of Almighty God, and they have to raise up a deception that is equivalent in strength to the truth. And that's what they did. <clears throat> they didn't destroy us with guns and bombs. They didn't destroy us with inquisitions. We just wouldn't die. So they had to cause us to commit suicide. And they did it through, 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 through futurism to get their enemies to kill themselves. Now, you're going to say, well, Tom, that, aren't you overstating things? No, I'm not. Who protests the papacy anymore? Who knows who the Antichrist is anymore? You see, the knowledge of who the Antichrist is, the papacy, and that he reigns over the kings of the earth, makes you hard to control, doesn't it? You want your own kingdom. Right? And your own king? Christ? You see, if you know who the Antichrist is, then it's much, much easier to align yourself with Christ. Because you can see the difference. But if you no longer know who the Antichrist is, then you've got nothing to compare to. And the Pope can run around in his funky hat, carrying a stick, a crooked stick, with a crucified Jesus on it, and everybody calls him the Vicar of Christ. So now everybody's confused. No, deluded. That's what the Bible calls it. Okay? To get them to begin to dabbling in the theory of a future Antichrist was worth a vast amount of time and labor to the Roman Catholic Church. I'll tell you what. It, futurism probably produced a greater windfall for the Roman Catholic Church than they ever could have dreamed. And now you wonder... Why John, when he saw her, that is the Roman Catholic Church, he wondered with great admiration. You've got to admire a deception that can deceive even God's elect. And it has. Sorry to end on such a bad note, but the truth hurts. Acknowledging the pain is the first effort to recovery. I'll see you tomorrow. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Visit crosstheborder.org C-R-O-S-S CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. That's CrossTheBorder.org I know you all want answers and believe me, so do I and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Cancelled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. 
get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's CrossTheBorder.org.